Hello! Welcome to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the readings. If you'd like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. On the second Wednesday of the month, yay! Before we do anything, I just want to thank our bartender, Kelly. Working hard to keep you hydrated, hard or soft, please buy a drink, support the bar, support the series, you keep the series going in perpetuity. I love that word, isn't that a great word? Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm excited about our guests tonight, Nicholas Kaufman and Nassim Jamnia, who are reading for us. Nick is, how many times have you read here? This will be your third time or your fourth time? Third this time. is your third time, and Nassim is uh, the first time reading here, so we are... Uh, happy to welcome here, welcome them here tonight. So thank you all for coming. Um, so the series itself, we, uh, we we buy the the guest drinks and we take them out to dinner afterwards, and we also give them a small stipend just to make their trip. Sometimes they're not local to the city to make their trip here worthwhile. We give them a little money. So we're running out. I mean, I hate to to do that, but we're actually. Uh, we, we need support. We need the support of the community. So we're going to start a GoFundMe. Uh, but if you don't want to wait for that, that's going to happen next month. We're going to do a GoFundMe. And uh, Ellen Datlow, uh, who's my co-conspirator co-conspirator co here, is going to offer um, a couple of uh, Pick My Brain, which means you can basically uh, Skype with her and uh, communicate, uh, <laughs> ask her any questions that you want. Um, for about an hour. For an hour. And uh, I'll be offering a couple uh, short story critiques, and we might have other things to offer. We're not going to do like the big thing, like the Kickstarter, where you have like millions of prizes, because both of us are just overextended at the at the moment. But yes, we're going to do a GoFundMe. But if you don't want to wait until that starts, go to kgbfantasticfiction.org, and you can donate. We have a PayPal button. You can just donate money if you want to support the series. But always buy a drink at the bar. Tip your bartender. Yeah. Yes, please do that. Um, we we want to stay at the bar. We love we love the KGB bar. So please do that. On to our guest this evening. Oh, before before we, one more thing. Uh, next month, October twelfth. Uh, just a reminder, we're on the second Wednesday of the month now instead of the third. October twelfth, Clay McLeod Chapman and Meg Ellison. November 9th, Stephanie Feldman, Eileen Gunn. December fourteenth, Richard Cadry and Cassandra Caw. January 11th, Christopher M. That's 2023. We're already in next year. Christopher M. Savasco and our favorite guest. TBD. There you go. TBD. TBA. Thank you. February 8th, Marie Vibert. So uh, we hope you will join us this year and next. Uh, this is, uh, you know, one of the, uh, you know, funnest things that I do to host this series and I get to meet uh, great authors every month and all of you so thank you for, for supporting the series we appreciate it our, our first guest is Nicholas Kaufman Nick Kaufman is a Bram Stoker Award nominated Thriller Award nominated Shirley Jackson Award nominated and Dragon Award nominated author he's written numerous works of horror and fantasy including the bestsellers 100 Fathoms Below written with Stephen L. Kent and the Hungry Earth. By the way, Nick, do you have books for sale? I do have some, yeah. Okay, can I just have one? I'll just show the audience so we can... Uh, so at the break, we're going to have... Uh, you can come up and, and buy books from Nick and Nassim and, and get them signed. Uh, here we go, The Hungry Earth. So, hang on. Hang on, Gordon. Thank you. The Hungry Earth. His short fiction has appeared in Cemetery Dance, Black Static, Nightmare Magazine, Inner Zone, and others. In addition to his own original work, he's written for such properties as Zombies vs. Robots, The Rocketeer, and Warhammer. He and his wife, Alexa, live in Brooklyn, New York. Here's Nick Kaufman. <laughs>
thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back reading uh, for the KGB Fantastic Fiction series. Uh, and I'm especially psyched uh, to be reading tonight with Nassim Jamnia. They seem pretty cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing them read. So um, I'm going to do something that they always tell you not to do. Uh, and I'm going to read from a work in progress. Now, the reason they t there are two reasons they tell you not to read from a work in progress. The first is that it's just it's not in its final perfect form, or, or I should say polished form. Nothing is ever perfect. Um, uh, and so it, you know it may be a little clunky. It may not be great. Uh, but I figure, if comedians can sort of hone their jokes at, at clubs, you know, I can kind of do the same at a reading. Um, and the second thing, the second reason they tell you not to do this is because if the audience likes it, they can't go buy it, um, which is valid. Uh, so uh, I ask of you, if you like what you hear tonight, please check out one of the other books that I've brought along. You might like that too. So um, let's see here. The title is currently The Endless Black Cathedral. Under the harsh lights of the hospital corridor, Lubli handed me a simple spiral-bound notebook and a sharpened pencil that looked fresh from the box. Every question you ask, he said, and every answer Herr Becker gives must be written on this notepad. Jürgen Lubli had been my direct supervisor for the past decade. Of all the things he'd ever handed me, weapons, dossiers, microfilm, a pad and pencil were definitely the most unexpected. I took them from him. Is this because of his injuries, I asked. Lubli scoffed. Injuries? You make it sound like he didn't do it to himself. And yes, but the notes are also for security purposes. He escorted me down the hospital hallway. A skinny, nervous-looking nurse walked with us, fidgeting with a room key in her hand. She kept her gaze to the floor. More nurses moved in and out of the rooms we passed, gliding ghost-like through the halls in their white uniforms. They cast sympathetic looks at the nurse accompanying us, but they avoided eye contact with Lubli and myself. They knew we were with the BND, West Germany's Federal Intelligence Service, and though we were ostensibly the good guys compared to the Stasi, they still feared us. Nurses know the smell of blood, and they could smell it on our hands. The hospital walls were a shiny pale green tile, a sickly color that left me uneasy. Black spots of mold spattered the tiles near the floor. A man cried out from one of the rooms we passed, a reminder that this was no ordinary hospital. This was a place for lost souls, people whose minds had cracked. It was impossible to believe Klaus Becker was being kept here. Becker was one of the BND's greatest surveillance agents. They said he could hear a feather fall inside a bugged room. They said he could identify the make of a shoe from the sound of its scuff on the floor of Berlin Friedrichstrasse Station, a master in the art of eavesdropping, now an inmate in a hospital for the mad. Becker's last assignment had been to eavesdrop on the Bauer Conservatory, a music academy in the Soviet sector of Berlin, on the other side of the barbed wire and concrete wall the Soviets constructed just a couple of months ago. An anti-fascist bulwark, they called it, but everyone knew its true purpose was to stop defectors from fleeing to the West. Of course, no one was in danger of defecting from the Bauer Conservatory. It was the height of comfort, elegance, and extravagance, dating back to the early Weimar days. I'd seen pictures. It was all marble and polished wood with decadent, intricate detailing. The classrooms were specially designed to maximize acoustics. The student living quarters were finer than some of the apartments I'd lived in. Nestled in the center of the building, like the stone of a plum, was a world-renowned concert hall. No one, no one would give up that kind of luxury, not by choice. What brought the Bauer Conservatory to the BND's attention was the fact that among its students was the daughter of Major Yui Weber, a high-ranking Soviet military official. Weber possessed sensitive information the BND was desperate to get their hands on. Goethe Weber, his only child, a 19-year-old girl studying to play the flute, was our point of access. The plan was to bug the Bauer Conservatory put master eavesdropper Klaus Becker in earphones on this end and wait to see what the girl let slip to her friends or what dear old papa said to her over the telephone. 
Short of bugging Weber's own office, which had so far proved impossible, it wasn't a bad plan. Except, two weeks into Becker's assignment, something went wrong, and he ended up here. I still didn't fully understand what happened. No one did. That's why I'd come, to make sense of it, and to assess if it would affect our new plan. Because the plan for Goethe Weber had changed. Lubli stopped in front of the room I assumed was Becker's. There was no name on the door, just metal numbers screwed into the painted peeling wood, 14. There was no room 13 in the hospital because it was considered bad luck. Technically, that made Becker's room 13, despite the number on the door. Unlucky, but then it seemed Becker's luck had already run out. Open it, Lubli said to the nurse. The nervous woman slotted the key into the keyhole and turned it. There was a loud metallic clunk as the bolt unlatched. She reached to open the door, but Lubli stopped her and turned to me. Remember, everything must be written on the pad, he said. When you're through, you must bring the pad out with you and return it to me. No one else can see it. No page can be left behind for enemy agents to find. The Stasi had eyes and ears everywhere, just like we did maybe even here in the hospital. West Berlin was a tiny island of West Germany in the sea of Soviet-controlled East, surrounded, outnumbered, and always on the verge of being subsumed. There was a feeling among BND agents that we were all that stood between the Soviets and the rest of Germany. It was a feeling that should have inspired pride. Instead, it brought only suspicion and paranoia. The pencil too, Lubli added. It must not be left behind. That is of extreme importance. Because of what he did, I agreed. Do you think he would do something like that again? I think he would do worse, Lubli said, then nodded to the nurse to open the door. I stepped inside while the others remained in the hall. The door closed behind me. The key turned again. The bolt latched, and I found myself alone in a room with an alleged madman. Becker's hospital room was small, the walls were the same sickly pale green color as the hallway. The light fixture was a single light bulb dangling from the ceiling. Sunlight tried to force its way in through the lone grimy window, mostly in vain. A fly, trapped and buzzing angrily, repeatedly hurled itself headlong against the glass, desperate to escape. I couldn't blame it. If the patients here weren't already mad, being forced to stay in rooms like this one would drive them there soon enough. Becker sat upright on the bed, his back against the overstuffed padded headboard. He and I were the same age, creeping toward 50, but despite a lifetime of service in the BND, we'd never worked together. His job was to sit and listen in quiet rooms. I worked in the field. Now, face to face, it felt strange that we'd never met before this. He had piercing gray eyes, dark hair turning silver out the temples and one of those square jaws that plainer men like me envied. I nodded at him and tried not to stare at the bandages on either side of his head, where he had shoved a sharpened pencil into his ears and deafened himself. There was a chair in the room for visitors, but I chose to remain standing while I wrote on the pad. Good morning, Herr Becker. My name is Jonas Fischer. I am with the BND, working with Jürgen Lubli. I have a few questions for you. You are to write all your answers on this pad. Do you understand? I put the pad and pencil on top of a rolling table that stood next to the bed. I watched Becker carefully as he picked up the pencil, but he made no sudden moves at all. He wrote on the pad, then returned it to me. I know why you're here, Herr Fisher. You won't understand what I have to say any more than the others did. I wrote, indulge me. Why did you do this to yourself? He looked at it, shook his bandaged head, and dropped the notepad on the table. Are you a man of faith, Herr Fisher? he asked aloud. No longer able to hear himself speak, his words came out slightly slurred. I tapped the notepad with the pencil to indicate we were supposed to write down all our questions and answers. Indulge me, he said, turning my own words against me. Just nod yes or no. Do you believe in God? I nodded because it was the smart thing to do, but the truth was more complicated. Sixteen years had passed since the Third Reich died with Hitler in his bunker, but I still didn't feel safe telling anyone I was a Jew. I wasn't even a practicing Jew, not that it mattered. To the Nazis, and therefore to the German people, because who were the Nazis if not my fellow Germans? A Jew 
was a Jew, was a Jew. And what about evil? What about evil, Herr Fischer? Do you believe in the existence of evil? I nodded again. Of course I believed in the existence of evil, what German Jew didn't. I used to believe in God, Becker continued. There was a time when I couldn't look up to the he- when I could look up to the heavens, and in the night stars I could see a glittering cathedral to the glory of God. Not any more. Now I know what's out there, among those same stars. I've seen it in my dreams. Seen what? I asked, but he didn't hear me, nor did he see my lips move, because he was already bent over the notepad writing. He handed the pad back to me. I drove the pencil into my ears because I could no longer bear to listen to the music Goethe Weber played on her flute. I call it music only because I don't know what other name to give it. It was something else. It was madness. The more I heard it, the more it infected my dreams, turning them into twisted, tortured visions. I had to end it. This was the only way. I read his note twice. They were the words of a madman. Perhaps he belonged in this hospital after all. She's just a 19-year-old girl, I wrote back, trying to force rational thought back into his mind. Nothing is what it seems, Herr Fisher, least of all her. I'm not even sure she's human. Of course she's human, I wrote. These strange accusations were putting me on edge. My penmanship suffered for it, forcing me to cross out a misspelled word and start again. I've seen her picture, I wrote. She's a beautiful young woman. Evil can be beautiful. That's how it deceives us, he wrote. I was taken in by her youth and beauty. I can't explain how I felt. All I can say is, I am a foolish old man. It occurred to me what he was trying to tell me. I wrote, you fell in love with her, even though you were miles apart and all you saw of her was a picture in a file? His face reddened with humiliation. He wrote, evil is seductive. First it drives you mad with desire, then it simply drives you mad. I was right. He'd loved her from afar, but somehow that love had turned to lunacy, and now he thought of her as some kind of devil. Perhaps it was guilt for allowing himself to feel something for the young woman he was spying on. Very few of us in the BND had families. It was a lonely life. Maybe that loneliness had become too much for him. I took up the pad and pencil and explained to him in writing that the situation had changed. Recently, two valuable West German assets on a sensitive mission had been captured by the Soviets. As a result, I would be leading a small covert team into the Soviet sector tomorrow night to extract Gerda Weber from the Bauer Academy and bring her back to West Berlin, where we would trade her for those captured assets. Time was of the essence, which meant there was little time to prepare. We had to make the exchange quickly before the Soviets had a chance to interrogate our assets. I asked Becker if there was anything he could think of that we needed to be prepared for at the academy. Had he overheard anyone mention how many guards there were or their patrolling schedules? Any weapons that might be stashed inside the building? Was there an alarm system? Was video surveillance part of their security? He took his time reading what I had written. Then, in reply, he wrote a single word, flute. I wrote back, what about it? He underlined the word frantically and wrote, it must not be left behind. It must be brought to West Berlin with her. I shook my head and scribbled on the pad, impossible. When we extract her, we'll have to move fast. There won't be time to take any of her belongings. Becker frantically circled the word flute. I didn't know why he was so insistent, and I was losing patience with his riddles. The door opened then, and and the nervous-looking nurse told me I had to go because it was time for Becker's medication. Lubli was waiting for me in the hallway outside. I joined him, and as the door to Becker's room swung shut, I caught a glimpse of the nurse approaching the patient in bed with a full syringe in her hand. A sedative, presumably to keep him bedridden. It made me wonder if he'd ever tried to escape, ever tried to contact Goethe Weber. Lubli took the pad and pencil from me. Did you learn anything worthwhile? Only that Herr Becker has lost his mind, I replied. Mad men know nothing, he said, perhaps quoting Poe. Yet despite Becker's condition, I was convinced he knew something, something to do with Goethe Weber something I needed to know if I was going to lead the mission to extract her. 
As Lubli tucked the notepad into his jacket pocket and led me out of the hospital, I knew where my next stop would be. Scene break. <laughs> At first, all that came through the headphones was the hiss of the tape as it moved through the reel-to-reel -reel deck on the table in front of me. It was the surveillance, rec surveillance recording made the same night Becker stabbed both his eardrums with a sharpened pencil. The room where I sat was small, dark, and reeked of cigarette smoke from the countless agents who'd sat here and listened to surveillance tapes before me. It was one of dozens of similar rooms in the BND headquarters outside Munich. I'd never been comfortable in this building. It had originally been built back in the 1930s as a model village for staff members of the Nazi party, and when I was inside it, I flinched at every loud noise, at each unexpected person I encountered when rounding a corner, as though it had all been an elaborate ruse, and the Nazis were still here, waiting for me, the one that got away. Occasionally, I appreciated the irony that a Jew who spent his years hiding in a basement in Frankfurt with 27 other people, often starving and living in our own filth, now walked these halls a free man. All the same, I much preferred being out in the field. There were too many ghosts here. Their evil permeated the walls even more than the cigarette smoke. Eventually, the empty hiss of the tape was replaced by voices, Gerda Weber talking to a teacher at the Bauer Conservatory. I could tell from the acoustics that they were in one of the classrooms. Gerda explained that she wished to stay up to continue practicing, then bid her teacher good night. Her voice was light and sweet, her tone courteous and deferential. The file on the desk was open to a black and white photograph of her, taken on the street outside the academy. In it, Gerda is unaware she's, she was being photographed, looking to one side and smiling slightly as though she'd just seen something amusing or heartwarming. She was beautiful, there was no denying it. Ethereal and refined, it was easy to see why Becker, in a fit of loneliness, fell in love with her. If I stared at her picture every day for two weeks, maybe I would too, maybe anyone would. On the tape, the classroom door closed as, as the teacher left. There was silence for a moment. I imagined Gerda raising the flute to her lips. Then the music came and my skin prickled. The hairs on the back of my neck rose. I couldn't comprehend what I was listening to. It was music, yes, but it wasn't like any music I'd heard before, as if Gerda Weber had invented a whole range of new notes. It was rhythmic and repetitive, almost mesmerizing. And I could have sworn there were times when it sounded like other flutes were playing alongside hers. Though I remained seated in my chair, I felt as though I were falling, tumbling through a dizzying void. A sharp pain pierced the front of my skull like a drill bit between the eyes. The walls closed in around me. The evil infused within them seeped out like sweat. In my mind's eye, I saw flashes of unrecognizable colors and squirming, grasping shapes. The pain in my head grew sharper, more insistent, and a scream built in my voice, the only release I could imagine from the terrible pressure. And then the music ended and I was shivering in my chair, my hair plastered to my forehead with sweat. Becker was right to call this music madness. Forced to listen to it day in and day out, it was no wonder he deafened himself. I snatched up Gerda Weber's file and bolted from the room, intent on putting as much distance between myself and that recording as I could. Thank you. <laughs> So how close to the end of the book are you? Oh, finishing it? No, seriously. This is just a story. It's so a story, yeah. oh. So when is it going to be done? <laughs> I miss it now. <laughs> I mean, it's not most of the story. So is it, I mean, just worry. Um, we did warn you that, and you know, I'm glad you didn't read the whole thing because it would have been Yeah, it's like public. a 9,500 word story. Oh, so. okay, well, <laughs> okay, okay, great. Well, it's... That sounds good. Thank you. Where is it going to appear? Do you, I mean, has it been, is it for an anthology? It's for an anthology, something? but it hasn't been announced. So I, okay. I shouldn't be the one to announce it yet. All right. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, when will it be out? Do you know? The uh, anthology. 23? You know, if the world survives 2024, probably. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, thank you. Uh, we're going to take about a 10-minute break. Please hydrate yourself. Drink. 
alcohol or non-alcohol, and we'll be back in about 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. With my camera. I can delete it if I don't like it. <laughs> well, all right. Anyway, welcome back to Fantastic Fiction at KGB. It's lovely to see such a crowd and new faces, which is really interesting and gratifying. Um, anyway, our second reader is um, Nassim Jamnia. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, they're an author of The Bruising of... Oh, gosh, I should, I'm sorry, I should have asked you. Of Kilwa. Thank you, Kilwa. Tachyon Publications, which introduces their queer normative Persian inspired world. This is not the right place. Leave it. Okay. Their work has appeared in the Washington Post, Cosmopolitan. I didn't know it, it still existed. Is it the same one that we loved and yeah. knew and hate? Okay. All right. Um, the Writer's Chronicle, The Rumpus, and other venues. They've also received fellowships from Lambda Literary. Bitch Media and otherwise, and were named the inaugural Samuel R. Delaney Fellow. Congratulations. A Persian Chicagoan, Nassim now lives in Reno with their husband, dog, and two cats. Please welcome Nassim. All right. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so The Bruising of Kilwa came out about a month ago, so this is technically book tour, which is very exciting. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, it's my debut novella, came out with Tachyon, like we said. It follows a non-binary refugee healer who arrives in their new city state, that's a secondary world, um, to be confronted with a magical plague, uh, which they are trying to cure while hiding the fact that they have blood magic. So I'm going to read two scenes. The first one is an early scene. Uh, Firuz, the main character, has gotten work at a free clinic run by a healer named Kofi. And this scene hints at kind of the larger mystery that's going on in the novella. Um, I do want to give a heads up that there's a lot of medical gore in it, and it talks about the plague, so sorry, I didn't mean to write a plague book during a plague. <laughs> um, and there's some mentions of medical racism as well, so. The heat from the brick oven tucked in the alleyway danced on Firuz's skin. Mask and gloves in place, they mouthed a traditional send-off before heaving the body into the waiting flames. It was not a healer's job to dispose of the dead, but over the past few weeks, the distinction between mortuary and clinic had, for all of these purposes, faded. The oven was scant fingers large enough to fit the corpse, and Firuz's navel pinched before they squashed the feeling and the body down. They had no choice. Disposing of the plague victims in any other way invited further disease. They snapped off their gloves and masks and tossed those into the fire, too, before shutting the oven door. That's the last of them, Kofi Khan, they called when they returned inside. We can close up now. Their belly rumbled its eagerness to depart. Not quite. The curtain leading to the examination rooms pulled back, and Kofi poked his head out. Come back here for a moment. What's going on? Kofi gestured down the hall. We have a visitor. In the furthest room, where they usually stored equipment and mixed treatments, stood a familiar grim-faced mortician. Hair shorn since the last time Firuz had seen her, wearing the tight black garb of a person who didn't want their sleeves caught in their oft unclean work, mortician Malika had worked closely with Firuz over the weeks, as Kofi's was the closest clinic whose healers don't have asses for brains. <laughs> She also once told Fidu she worked with the dead because she wanted to avoid dealing with the complaints of the living. <laughs> the plague had turned everything on its head. Malika Khan, what brings you here? Her attention flicked towards them and back, and Fidu's followed her gaze to the raised sheet stretched over an examination bed that did not usually reside there. Is that a person? Technically a corpse, she crossed her arms. I was hoping an addict might make sense of this. Not another plague victim, then. If it is, then the plague has changed and we're mucked. Despite the progress made over the last many months, getting people from all parts of the city access to clean water, a volunteer band of magic users who went through the streets and destroyed any waste that might contribute to disease, a recent donation by one of the wealthy merchant families of much-needed food, up the death toll still ticked. 
If more migrants arrived from Del Moon, the city would be in even more trouble, especially if the ancient Aziza Kiwabi Academy continued to oppose their entry on the grounds of public health. Fidus grabbed the gloves Kofi offered, although he wasn't wearing any. Kofi Khan? We already talked about it. As was his habit, Kofi motioned with his chin to Malika, whose arms were crossed. I did a preliminary exam, and I don't want to bias either of us. Let's hear what you see. Fidus's hand hesitated by a mask. Eight months working with Kofi, and Fidus had learned it was safe to relax around him. During their training in Del Moon, they'd been subject subjected to constant tests of skill, but Kofi trusted Firuz. He insisted they were well-trained, needed only experience to call himself a full healer. But something about this felt off. Perhaps it was the furrow in Kofi's brow, or the way he wouldn't look directly at the corpse, but instead focused on his dark hands. Well, regardless, Firuz's duty lay with the person awaiting them, living or dead. After snapping on the mask, they fold the sheet away from the corpse's face. I take it I should not ask what's unusual about this one? It seemed normal enough. They fingered the sagging jaw, the bloated cheeks, before pulling the sheet further down. Malika pulled up her own mask from around her neck for the sake of the imminent smell. I can tell you it's the fourth one in this state, and it's unlike anything I've ever seen. The stomach, already green with the telling patch of decay, distended around their touch. Gases expelled into the air, smelling of sulfurous rotten eggs and sun-heated garbage. Firuz turned their cheek to breathe in the scent of dried herbs the mask had been nestled in as Malika coughed. Firuz was familiar with decayed bodies along with live ones. They didn't need to access their magic to feel something about this was very, very wrong. Under normal circumstances, the gut spilled into the blood, consumed the body from the inside out. The marrow no longer cranked out new life, and over time, only bones remained. The marrow here was doing something, even though it should have long been still. How long has this one been dead? Fidu's retrieved surgical tools. The putridity, or rather the lack of it after the initial discharge, concerned them. Malika bounced a fist on her thigh. One week, Fidu's head snapped up, excuse me? The bouncing stopped, and she slid her hands into pockets and bowed her head. That's why I brought it here. At one week, the body should have been well into decay, its odor a mix of wet rot, too ripe fruit, and rancid meat. The initial gases had resembled that bouquet of scents, but there was no real skin slippage as Fidus pinched the arm, no telltale yellow marbling. It was as though the body had begun its decay, then stopped, or had picked parts of the process to continue the way a farmer picked dates. Their blades slid through the chest like a ripe mango, the skin curling as the pressure released. Firu suppressed a gag. The body was rotting all right, although the outside didn't mirror the internal goo. Firu used a rag to wipe down the flat bone connecting the ribs before tapping it, but did not hear the expected hollowish ring. Kofi Han, can you? Kofi already held up the handsaw, then flipped the skin back so Firu could work. You suspect the marrow? Maybe. Something is stopping full putrefaction. They did not elaborate, did not want to utter the fears nipping at the small of their back. In normal circumstances, bones were home to spongy crisscrosses of red or yellow fibers, the sight of blood-making marrow. As a person aged, so too did the composition of these fibers change. Yet those here were dense, resembling a newborn babe's. A chunk of sternum in hand, Firu stepped to the magnifying lens set on the back counter, but there was a more precise way to puzzle out what was happening. With their back to the others, they freed the tip of the needle sewn in their sleeve and pressed it to their wrist until a drop of blood welled up. Blood would tell, as it always did. Red smeared against white, they used the energy surging through their veins to explore the bone's makeup, even as they pressed their cheekbones into the eyepiece of the lens. The magic allowed them to feel the internal structure, run invisible hands along the matrix inside. The blood still present felt wrong, lacking something, and the bone was too thin, as if eroded away. And the marrow? Most of it was silent, but a part of it thrummed, even now trying to create without the prerequisite ingredients. Which was impossible. The person was dead, literally cut open by Firuz's own hands. Still, the bone whispered its life, its desire to create. No, there was something, or someone, behind this. 
playing with bodies with a careless disregard that twisted fetus is insides. Earlier, they'd been hungry, their appetite had long since fled, and without the exam, they didn't know where to settle. What did you feel when you checked? Kofi moved one hand over the open chest cavity as his other directed the spinning water wheel in the corner from which he drew his energy. The gooey inner shifted in tandem. Viscous like it should be, no stirring of the muscles, dead but not yet decayed. He dropped the motion. Malika tapped her toes in a rhythm Fidus could almost place. So, any thoughts? Some kind of preservation spell, with maybe food as the medium. Delai slipped out without a second thought as they dumped their tools in a bucket and reached for the mixture of herbs bundled for a cleansing solution. Though why someone is preserving bodies is beyond me. Hmm. Malika scratched her scalp as she considered. Grave robbers, perhaps? Some of the other free states could have seen this as an opportunity for their physicers. Foolish, dismissed Kofi. He wrapped the body with the sheet, securing it with tight knots. Risk their trainees getting sick? Malika toyed with her sleeve, plucking and twisting the cloth. Honestly, I'd consider it in their shoes. Use the distraction of the plague to sneak out other bodies. Great way to learn. Best way, really. In any case, Fidu's interrupted, needing to go boil water for their instruments. I'd burn them as they come in and not worry about it. We have enough on our plates as it is. Malika sighed, then grabbed the bottom half of the wrapped corpse so Kofi wouldn't have to carry it out alone. Guess we can do that. Keep watch for me, will you? I want to monitor the situation. Of course. The truth was, thought Fidu's as they washed their hands, this was the work of the most incompetent blood magic user they'd ever seen. <laughs> Do we still have time for one more? Okay. <clears throat> um, so the next scene I'm going to read happens um, much further in the book. Uh, Kofi and Fidu's are, um, have spent this morning asking other clinicians whether they've seen anything about a new disease that they've encountered. Um, on the same day that they're summoned to the governor, with whom Kofi has been fighting kind of at this point for almost about a year. And um, I'm reading the scene because it gets at some of the political history that hopefully other books will uh, will cover, but you know, that depends on submission, so wish me luck. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, and there is this direct discussion of medical racism and the genocide here. The audience chamber was more subdued than the entrance hall. Oh, sure, the carpet was plush, the same dark red as the sofas in the freshening up room. And the rich mahogany desk the governor sat at was far larger than it had any right to be. And the hung portraits of the historic queens of Kilwa were lovely, but the room was otherwise unadorned. The governor was not alone. The city chamberlain stood beside her, straightening from the documents the two had been examining when Kofi and Firuz were announced. He was a reedy, bespectacled man whom Firuz had seen beside the governor the few times she'd come down to the city for an event. The haughty disrespect on the mustached face made their skin crawl. Unlike her financier, the governor was the picture of soft kindness, braided hair pulled back from her round face, a twinkle in her eye, clothes bright pink and blue and red. It seemed unimaginable that such a woman was behind the vicious laws shunting Fidus's people into extreme poverty and pain. And then her lip curled. Ah, healer Kofi, you have finally graced us with your presence. No social niceties and greetings, no polite inquiries into family, not even rising. Fidus could have snarled at the clear insult. Kofi bowed his head, but not to appear dismayed or chastised. You must be for forgive me, Governor. Our clinic has been particularly busy these past months. So I've heard. She rose then, swept past her companion to come around to the front of the desk. Even by Kilwan standards, she was an impressive woman, tall, sturdy, exuding an aura of confidence. Fidus had heard through the gossip of healer and patients alike that for the rich merchants of Kilwa, she was a boon and a blessing. The pressure would lighten if you sold the clinic. If you have called me up for this discussion again, Governor, I'm afraid it has been a waste of both my time and yours. Hmm. Pity. The Governor's eyes flicked to Fidus. So this is your assistant. Your patients praise your skills. Fidus swallowed and worked to keep the weariness out of their response. I'm glad to hear it. Your background, she continued, as though they had not spoken, does not seem to bother them. Tell me, when did you and your family come here? You do have a family with you, do you not? A mother and a brother? The implicit threat almost raised Firuz's hackles. 
Instead, they linked their hands behind their back. Yes, Hanuma governor. We arrived about a year and a half ago. I see. Pray tell, what were the circumstances of your arrival? The governor tilted her head with an innocuous blink. Is this line of questioning really necessary, governor? Rumbled Kofi. Firu shook their head. It's all right, Kofi Khan. They flashed their most dazzling smile at the governor. As I'm sure you know, governor, Chamberlain, my home country of Del Moon has been under siege by both sky and land. Sky, with the ravages of the Homa bird over the past four decades. Land, predominantly over the past two years from an unknown group or force specifically targeting those of Sasanian heritage. My local elders urged me to relocate my family to a place where we might be safe from both. With their permission and Kofi Khan's sponsorship, we came here. The latter was a lie. In their gut, though, Fidu's knew Kofi would let it stand. How interesting and unfortunate, said the governor. Not so, said Firuz. We are happy here. Kofi Khan is an excellent mentor and friend. I'm glad to be in Kilwa. This aligns with the other stories we've heard, piped in the Chamberlain, whose nasally voice, seasonal hypersensitivity, masses in the sinal cavities, made Firuz's magic itch. <laughs> Though many of your kind neglected to go through such proper channels, Firuz smelt their smile grow icy. Your kind, as if Kilwans and Sasanians were so fundamentally different. Fear for one's family and own life can do that, Chamberlain. I pray you will never have to experience it. Chamberlain sneered. One hopes such fears turn out to be unfounded. Uh, unfounded? Fidus worked their jaw up and down. Would sarcasm hurt their cause? Assistant healer, interrupted the governor. You said your elders encouraged you to move here. It's my understanding most Sasanians don't have contact with their elders unless they are blood magic users. Of course, the real reason the governor had wanted to meet them. So Kilowans were aware of modern blood magic after all, and if the open suspicion on the Chamberlain's face was indicative of anything, it was the fear of such magic coming, or perhaps returning, to the island, where it might wreak untold havoc. And was that fear unfounded, given the preserved bodies, maybe even the blood bruising? I'm afraid you've been misinformed, Governor. Even as Firuz fumed, they slowed their heart rate, forced themselves to remain calm. Many of us know the elders for other reasons. My mother is a devout woman. She went to only those elders who are priests. Furthermore, I practice my healing through structural magic, runes. They balanced their healer's bag on their hip. From behind them came a shift of leather and metal. Firuz gave the suspicious guards a cool look, despite the bulge of nerves in their throat at the unsheathed weapon before distracting, extracting a brush and bottle of ink to show. Only when necessary, of course. Most patients can be treated with physicing sciences rather than magical ones. Governor, Kofi sounded wearier than fears had ever heard him. Did you call us here to interrogate my assistant or did you want to discuss your latest, latest legislation? The governor's focus stayed on Firuz for too long before she turned to Kofi. I believe it was you who had grievances against it, healer Kofi. <clears throat> Sorry. Unfortunately, Physiker Faiza could not join us today, but we designed these plans together with her full support. If Kofi twitched upon hearing the name of an old university colleague, Firuz didn't see. Tell me your objections and perhaps we can sort something out. Pitfalls in every suggestion. Firuz forced himself to breathe as Kofi launched into his diatribe against the patient quota, minimum payment, a mandatory second opinion. As patrons of the sole free clinic left standing, Kofi's patients could not afford these changes. The governor folded her hands in her lap. The council passed this bill unanimously, Kofi. It's how clinics that receive our funding can, can continue to function. The city coffers are, unfortunately, not so full that we can be as generous as we would like, added the Chamberlain. The lie was so foul, Fidus could smell it from the slums. I am sorry to hear you say that, Chamberlain. Kofi picked up his healer bag with a nonchalance Fidus hoped to em emulate. I believe you will find the treasury a little fuller from here on out. The Chamberlain's pince visage curled the rem remnants of attempted compromise in the air. And why is that, healer? Because if this is what needs to happen to be funded by the government, then I will no longer take such money. Kofi nodded. Good day, Governor, Chamberlain. Come, Firuz. Our patients await. Finally. Kofi had been debating this decision for weeks and it was about time he'd made it. This would make the day-to-day -day of running the clinic difficult moving forward but not impossible. Beatus gripped their bag tighter. Forward was where they were headed. 
You always did love Sasanians more than your fellow kill ones, said the governor. Kofi stiffened, Fidu's gaped. Kofi's partner had died over a decade ago, but the comment was still unkind, to say the least. Should you change your mind, she continued, you know where to find me. Kofi did not bother to respond. Thank you. And there are books for sale that um, will be signed for you by Nassim, so please. And I think, does Nick have yeah, any more? Yeah, yeah. Do you have more, more copies? More. So please come and buy some books and have them signed personally to you. And drink some more and relax and have fun. And then we'll see you next month. <laughs> You have been listening to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB reading series. Check out our website at kgbfantasticfiction.org and click on support if you'd like to help keep the series going. Anyway, that's our show. Thanks for listening and see you next month.